Hey guys, you've probably heard by now about the Canton tornado that happened uh, last week, uh, late April of 2017. I want to go over a, a similar situation here um, that happened back in 84. And one thing that was unique about the Canton storm is it looks like a rather ordinary cell. If we run an animation, it doesn't look like anything unusual. Maybe as it crosses around the Eustace area near Athens, it becomes uh, pretty strong there. But it's actually, if we go to the storm relative velocity and look at the products there, we can see a bit of a different picture here. So there we've got a very strong rotational couplet, another one about 10 miles to the south. And you can see those worked up towards the Canton area rather quickly and produced EF4 damage. And there's a look at the track of the uh, tornado back on December 13th of 1984. It moved north 7.5 miles through residential areas, started right here around the Bulk Springs area. This was around uh, 9.42. F3 damage reported... Uh, little ways up the uh, road towards uh, Bruton, and it was Oriole Street here that got particularly hard hit. A lot of the houses on the east side of the street were completely demolished. And it looks like there's some gaps in those lots to this day. So probably uh, a lot of those houses did not rebuild. So there's the EF3 damage. Storm track went north across Mesquite High School. Signs blown over, part of a roof collapse there. Storm uh, moved up through Garland, and I, c I couldn't find any good documentation exactly where it was. But it did appear to be sighted right here around uh, Broadway and Centerville. A witness said the tornado was very thin and rope-like. This was about 10 in the morning. And it continued moving north over uh, Shorehaven Elementary School and worked its way up to just east of Highway 78 across uh, this subdivision here that was built in the early 80s. And then about around 10.05, it made it up into Wiley and Saxe and then Wiley. And at the time, this was all open fields. I mean, it was completely different back then, none of these subdivisions. And so there wasn't much storm damage reported up there. The last damage in the logs was from 1040 a.m. mobile home right around Princeton and that could have been from another cell on the line since that was about 40 minutes after the Garland damage. So altogether about 600 homes there are getting damaged. There was uh, no tornado warning on this uh, storm. It just wasn't detectable with the exist existing WSR 57 radar that was in service at the time. The uh, damage was 20 to 30 million dollars. Unfortunately, we don't have any archives of the radar data, and I've tried to contact NCDC about some other products trying to get Microfish radar, and uh, it's hard getting any response from them. So I've come up kind of dry on this storm, but we do have visible imagery. Let's check that out real quick. So this is about 8.31 a.m. and we see a cluster of storms down in the Waco area. And zooming out, we've got the classic comma cloud appearance indicating a strong upper level system and a lot of dry air coming in from the west. So zooming in on the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area, we'll bring this forward. There's uh, 9 a.m. You can see the line of storms coming up from the south and particularly strong storm here between Fairfield and Corsicana and a couple of other very strong storms around Centerville. Let me uh, put the time there at the bottom. Okay, there we go. So 9.31 a.m. You can see the storms are about to enter Dallas and Tarrant County. And I'm taking a look at my notes, and at the time this happened, Ferris was getting hit 
there was a DQ that was damaged, a golf station and a dairy farm. Eight people were injured. Twelve minutes later, it came up in a bulk springs. And the tornado was about to touch down here about uh, 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes later. So by the time we bring up the uh, 10 a.m. chart, the storms are already moving up into the Garland area. And yeah, so at the time, we did have a tornado moving through the Garland area. You can see the overshooting tops there, and also some fairly strong storms all the way from Athens down to about Jacksonville there. So yeah, we do get a little bit of a picture of what's going on with visible satellite imagery. And then we roll this forward, and at this point, the severe weather is starting to die down. Storms are moving to the north. We had a some storm damage at 10.40 a.m. around Princeton, right around this time. And then the line moved up into cooler air up in Oklahoma and fell apart. And then the dry slot moved in and cleared things out. So at least the people that were had to deal with damaged homes and stuff like that, that gave them a good chance to recover. And sometimes we don't always get that. Now this is infrared imagery. This is showing cloud top temperature. So these very cold tops here are shaded orange and red and that indicates probably some strong updrafts under those areas and what we see here when we go through these frames is a cell coming together just northeast of temple and i think this is the start of the dallas tornado storm and this is about uh, 7 30 a.m so we roll that forward and you can see wow it went really red right there east of waco about eight in the morning and the storms continue moving northward up near west and towards the Italy area along Interstate 35 East. And right around here, 9.31 a.m., the cells are moving into the Dallas area. The tornado is about to set down on the ground here. So you can see with this reddish shade, it's hard to tell where the updraft is. I'm, I really don't have any idea. Probably on the southeast side of this area. But it looks like another cell out around Fairfield, Texas, coming together there. And at this point, we have a tornado going through the Garland area right there. And it looks like uh, another little cell down the line. So this has kind of a discrete appearance. I think we've had the line kind of break up into a couple of strong storms. And that was kind of a short window there. You can see the the updrafts are starting to get into cooler air and the cloud tops start to become warmer. And then there's nothing left there at the end. So it's interesting there. It seems like the strongest window of severe weather was only from about uh, 8.31 a.m. to about uh, 9.30 and then 10 a.m. here and then and the uh, storm event was over. So that's what it looked like from the satellite imagery. Okay, so now we're taking a look at surface data. This is about 6 in the morning with digital atmosphere and global surface archives. And this is showing a bit of a cold front coming south out of Oklahoma. Let me paint that on here. cold front is coming somewhat like that right there and you can see there's a low pressure area a bear clinic low around the uh, Sweetwater Big Spring area right there and to the east of that we've got southerly flow coming up off the Gulf very moist conditions and if we look at the moisture axis Let's see what looks like mid 60s dew points right in this area right here. So that's probably some of the richest and deepest moisture that we have on the map. And you notice that the flow is out of the southeast here, southeast at about 10 miles an hour. 
kind of light, and that's helping to stretch out the curvature on the hodograph charts, which means we can get more corkscrewing of the air. The uh, contrast between these weaker southeast winds and the very strong southwesterly winds up at about three or 4,000 feet, that gives us very strong storm relative helicity and that helps these storms rotate. So what happened later during the day? Okay, so later in the day, this is the map around 9 a.m., just before the uh, tornadoes touched down. So we can see the cold front uh, still in place from southeast Oklahoma down to the south plains of Texas. And I need to caution that this is not actually what caused the tornadoes or helped. It didn't help uh, enhance them or anything like that because this occurred uh, a little bit further south in the relatively homogeneous air. And it's hard to know exactly what happened at the time. It was what Chuck Doswell calls a mesoscale accident. And this is subsynoptic data. There's no way we can resolve exactly what happened in this area right here. But I can see the backed wind flow. See there at Dallas and Greenville and Tyler, very consistent backing of the winds to about 140. That's going to definitely increase the curvature on your hodographs in this area. So that's a very subtle feature I would be looking at on an analysis chart like that. So our storm at the time was located uh, somewhere in this area and about to move into this area of better helicity. And this is what the chart looked like later in, in the afternoon, about 2, two o'clock. So we see what looks like a warm front uh, all the way up in to northwest Arkansas. Cold front like that right there. And we've got the dry slot working in right here. And maybe even a little bit of a, maybe a bit of a dry line feature like that right there. So by this time everything was over and the storms had moved northward over the colder air in Oklahoma. Maybe a few enhanced shower activity Maybe a bit of enhanced shower activity around the Fort Smith area, but I think the severe weather was pretty much over at this time. And then soundings, I, I couldn't I couldn't really find a good sounding. I went with Longview, which is located just southeast of Dallas. So we certainly had uh, some cape, but it was not a high cape day at all. But the uh, shear was quite important, and you can see between the surface and one kilometer sh uh, shear vectors. If we go between the storm motion vector and those two levels, we sweep out some very strong storm relative felicity. And with the very fast storm motions, we were looking at 40 to 50 knots moving to the north. So that may have had some impact there but still very strong helicities. Anyway, that's our retrospective of the storm. It's definitely very hard finding information on these older tornado outbreaks. It seems like anything before 2000, 2005, the information just vanishes. But it seemed like something had to be done to kind of um, memorialized this tornado from 84 so I did kind of a meteorological work up there and uh, kind of took you through a summary of what happened and uh, definitely leave a comment if you remember anything about the storm or have any information you want to put on there please do that so that's our tornado retrospective and hopefully we'll see you on the nightly webcast uh, pretty soon thanks <music>